like to direct everyone to the uh, 10th chapter of Hebrews. I certainly appreciate all who have joined in. Before we start, though, let's have a uh, short word of prayer. <clears throat> and Father, we pray the blessings upon us as we study that word. We're grateful for the eternal principles that are disclosed therein. And as diligent students of that word, we pray for the, the blessing that is uniquely ours as uh, students of thy holy word. May it enrich us. May we continue to grow in it. And may we continue to prepare ourselves to be meet for the master's use. In his name we pray. Amen. We'll start in the first verse of chapter 10. <clears throat> now the first four verses of chapter 10 have to do with the comparing the Levitical offerings and showing just exactly how um, insufficient they were, how the, they were uh, not, not sufficient to do what the new law does. It says there for the law, uh, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very images of the image of the things can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year after year, make those who approach perfect. <clears throat> so the old law is merely, that was merely a shadowy representation, that kind of a faint outline, if you will, of the new law. And it was not an exact image. <clears throat> In the gospel, we have uh, both the uh, image and the essence. The sacrifices of the old law were insufficient to cleanse us from all sin. But the sacrifice of the new law, that is, Jesus himself, could do that, 1 John 1, verse 7. You might take a look at this word perfect, because sometimes it's used in different ways. And I got this from some of the lexicons that I have on my electronic uh, Bible program. <clears throat> One says that these sacrifices of the old law could not put someone in the position in which he can come or stand before God. By his single offering, however, the high priest Christ was able to do this. And another one says perfect is to make one meet for future entrance in, in, on this state and give him a sure hope of it even here on earth. So in verse 2 it says, for then would they have not ceased to be offered. And this is <clears throat> posed as a question. And the question is that you would ask yourself, well, if these things could satisfy the requirement for sin offering, why do they have to be continually offered? <clears throat> it says, for the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But they did, they had to continually offering, offer sacrifices. So if the sacrifices of the old law really could take away the sins of the people, and there would have been no need to, to repeatedly offer them uh, for the same sins. You might just take an example from a commercial law that <clears throat> you know, once a debt has been extinguished, it does not have to be repaid a second time. So we all, we all understand that. And same deal with the uh, old law. Since it had to be repaid time and time again, it was never extinguished. In the third verse of chapter 10, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. <clears throat> and that was uh, done on the Day of Atonement. It was an annual sacrifice. But they did have other sacrifices for special sins, daily offerings, weekly offerings, uh, yearly offerings at the three great festivals in there. And there was a scapegoat, you know, that Day of Atonement, they would kill one uh, goat and then they would lay their hands on the others and send it out into the wilderness. That was a scapegoat. What all the uh, myriad of sacrifices could not accomplish 
the sins of the nation were, were laid on the goat, who laid their hands on him. He was sent away in the wilderness. The wilderness was a uh, just a land of uh, separation. People weren't there. So there was a reminder of sin year by year. That This had to be done every year. In the new covenant, <clears throat> Christ carried our sins to a land of separation, never to be remembered. So that made it in itself superior to the old law. <clears throat> Verse four, it says, for it is not possible that the blood of uh, bulls and goats could take away sins. Blood, uh, bulls and goats were of a lesser order than mankind for that reason. A bull or goat could not ransom a murderer, say. Someone on the same order as man, that being man himself, could sad, satisfy the requirement of justice and murder. Yeah, therefore, the uh, murderer had to forfeit his own life. He was on the equal uh, plane with the life that was taken. <clears throat> if you think about it, uh, man's sin killed his soul, so to speak. Therefore, only a man without sin was suitable to satisfy the requirement of justice in a soul murder. And that's what we all have all done by, uh, you know, all this sin falling short of the glory of God. That's, that's what we all done. So we, in essence, have murdered our own soul. <clears throat> and only a, the uh, perfect sacrifice of Jesus could satisfy the, the uh, requirement of justice. In Hebrews, the uh, 10th chapter, verses 5 through 18, <clears throat> it demonstrates there the all sufficiency of the one offering of Christ shown by in his fulfilling of the will of God and also in the full and complete forgiveness which it uh, procures for every obedient believer. In the fifth verse, we read that, therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice an offering you did not desire. That is to say, all the sacrifices and offering of the old law did not satisfy the justice of God. <clears throat> but a body you have prepared for me. <clears throat> Only the sacrifice of the Christ could satisfy the justice of God because he was the only one without sin. That uh, quotation there comes from the 40th Psalm verses 6 through 8. You can kind of uh, look at it there. Uh, it said, sin and offering you did not desire. My ears you have not, you have opened. Well, and of course, the uh, uh, quote in Hebrews was taken from the Septuagint. <clears throat> when the translators of the Septuagint uh, finished their work, the first part of it was, was exactly the same, but they changed the second part <clears throat> because the, the Hebrew says, my ears you have opened, or I think the King James says, uh, you have bored my ears or something like that. Same same idea, you've opened them up. <clears throat> so why are they different? They're not the same thing. <clears throat> At least they're not the same wording. But <clears throat> my ears you have opened has the idea that you are receptive to what uh, is being said. You don't have your ears stopped up. You're receptive. <clears throat> but for the sacrifices and offerings of the New Testament to be receptive, there had to be a body prepared. And that's why the translators of the Septuagint translated it, but a body you have prepared for me. So they're, they're given the essence of my ears you have opened by that translation. <clears throat> 
uh, <coughs> excuse me. So for the uh, pre-incarnate Christ to qualify as a willing and obedient servant for the redemption of mankind, he had to have a physical body. <coughs> he had to be open. Uh, he had to be a willing and obedient servant. And so that's that's really the idea. <clears throat> but that's the uh, situation you sometimes get into when you when one is taken from the Septuagint and the other from the Hebrews. And he in the sixth verse of chapter ten, it says, "In burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin, sacrifices for sin." Now that that's a, a parallelism with. Uh, sacrifice and offering you did not desire and burn offerings and sacrifices of sin you had no pleasure it's parallel with what was said before uh, <clears throat> the sentiment that expressed here in in the uh, verse five previously it, that emphasizes that the levitical sacrifices could not accomplish the redemption of mankind <clears throat> Verse seven, he said there, then I said, uh, behold, I have come. <clears throat> in the volume or, or ASV, it says roll. And we're really talking about scrolls. <clears throat> in the volume of the book, it is written to me. Uh, this, this is a uh, parenthetical. If you're looking at the uh, New King James Version, there's a N dash after come and a uh, and as before to do your will. So this is a parenthetical statement in the volume of the book. It is written to me and it refers to the many prophecies in the Old Testament uh, regarding the coming of Christ. So with that the parenthetical it says, therefore, I, then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. And this is the reason that Jesus came to do the will of his father in heaven. <clears throat> in uh, verse eight, it says, previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to law. The uh, words of the Psalm describe the Christ, the antitype rather than David, the type, and that's the uh, one previously cited. <clears throat> Verse 9, and then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, and that's the whole system with all its offerings and sacrifices, because it couldn't take away sin, so it, it was just taken out of the way. So he takes away the first, that he may establish the second. They can't exist uh, side by side. It's the second uh, in which uh, Christ, Christ offered himself as the only sacrifice that could take away sin. <clears throat> Christ could not do the will of God and allow the mosaic economy to continue. The old and the new, uh, the provisional and the permanent could not exist together side by side. Verse 10 says, by that will, that is, that will that uh, Christ came to do, and it is manifest that that will did not contemplate a continuance of the sacrifices and offerings of the old law. This quote unquote will, God's redemptive design for mankind was conceived, purposed and predestined before the world began in the eternal mind of God. So it says, by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, the gospel plan of salvation, the uh, faith uh, for once, uh, for all times, and all people, delivered from the saints, that's what he's talking about. That's the gospel plan of salvation. <clears throat> In verse 11, it says, and every priest 
stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Uh, the little biblical sacrifices are, are numerous, often, and repetitive. And you might just think about all the blood that was shed uh, in the temple from all these sacrifices. There's, there's a lot. But the sacrifice of Christ was one time for all time, never to be repeated. In verse 12 says, but this man, after he, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. <clears throat> this man, Jesus, had only to offer one sacrifice himself. The priest had to offer sacrifices again and again. Whereas the high priest had to make their offering in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement and then get out, Jesus offered himself once and is now continually in the heavenly Holy of Holies at the right hand of God, interceding on our behalf, I might say. <clears throat> in the 13th verse, from that time waiting till his enemies were made his footstool, this again refers to Psalms 110. <clears throat> uh, it's not that he had, he had ceased to work for the redemption of mankind, but his sacrificial work was completed by the uh, all-sufficient offering of himself. <clears throat> 14th verse, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Now, this is the reason that he does not uh, have to continually repeat the offering of himself or any other offering. The those that uh, refer to in the, in the verse are the ones referred to in verse uh, 11 of chapter 2, who have put on Christ. We walk in, the, in newness of life. We were raised with Christ. <clears throat> It says in Hebrews, the second uh, chapter, verse 11, of course, we've been on that before, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. In Galatians 3, 27 says, for as many as you are, are baptized into Christ have put on Christ, so uh, we're in Christ. In Romans 6 4, it says there, therefore we were buried with him through baptism and unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also should walk in newness of life. And uh, those that are raised with Christ in, in uh, Colossians 2 12 were buried with him in baptism in which you are also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So we're raised with Christ, uh, Colossians uh, 3.11. In verse 15, it says, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us for after he had said before, now the author here is uh, when Al refer to the inspired writings of the Old Testament uh, to prove and illustrate his point. <clears throat> and one of the things he refers to <clears throat> is uh, Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verse 33 and 34. But this is the covenant that I, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. Well, I, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So under the new law, <clears throat> it was not a law of inheritance or of national identity. It was a law that one had to learn. 
And once, uh, since it was uh, the perfect law and the perfect sacrifice, once uh, iniquity was forgiven, repented of and forgiven, it was remembered no more. And it could be the case and often is that one sins again, but those past sins are, are gone, forgiven, forever forgotten. In verse 16, this is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds, and I will, in their minds, I will write them. In verse 17, then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. It's a, a repetitive of what was said in, in uh, Jeremiah. <clears throat> the object of uh, verses 15 and 17 is to prove from the Old Testament that the subjects of the New Testament enjoy free, full, and absolute forgiveness because of the one time, uh, for all time, might add, offering of Christ. They sin again, that's, that's true, but there is a, a provision for forgiveness of those sins too. <clears throat> In verse 18, he says, now where there is remission of, of these, there is no longer an offering of sin. Since Christ made the sacrifice of himself to bring absolute and everlasting forgiveness of sin, there is no need to continue to offer sacrifices for sin as was required on the old law. <clears throat> now verse 18 that we just read was the uh, end of the doctrinal part of the epistle, if you want to call it that. Uh, that uh, section uh, showed that uh, the way into the Holy of Holies has now been made manifest to us by the blood of Christ. It also shows that Christ is now there, he's there right now, having entered it by the means of his own blood as an atonement for our sins. And also he now sits on the throne, his throne at the right hand of God, and he's making intercession for man there and he's doing that by virtue of his atoning blood by that blood that atoning blood we are allowed to uh, boldly enter therein and be with him as heirs of the uh, eternal inheritance and most of which follows concerns matters of exhortation consolation and encouragement from here to the end of chapter 10, uh, and making some practical applications uh, of what has already been discussed, the author earnestly exhorts his readers to a greater zeal and diligence in their profession and practice of their Christian faith, while warning them yet again against the dangers and fe fearful consequences of apostasy. And he begins by making uh, four exhortations <clears throat> in verse 22, and we'll go th through these again, but in verse 22, he exhorts them to draw near to God. In verse 23, he exhorts them to hold fast their confession or confidence, if you will, their confession of hope. And in verse 24, he tells them, to watch over others, not just themselves, be concerned about others. And in verse 25, he tells them not to neglect the gathering together of, uh, of like-minded Christians to engage in a corporate worship. So in verse 19, <clears throat> he says, therefore brethren, uh, having boldness, and this is the same boldness that I mentioned in the Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, which is a, a free and fearless confidence, a, a cheerful courage, uh, not having any, any reason to doubt any longer. That's the boldness one gets from that. Having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, and the means 
of the Holy is, is, of course, the blood of Jesus. That's the way that by which we gain access to the Holy of spiritual Holy of Holies. In verse 20, it's just continuation of verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holies by the blood of Jesus, by a new, and that new uh, way was recently initiated and consecrated by Christ, a new and living way. Christ is living. He's he's not a something someone that's dead. He's living by a new and living way. That's Christ. The entryway to the heavenly holy of holies by which uh, he, he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. So the uh, rent flesh of Jesus Christ is the only medium of access to God in the Christian age. The rent veil of the temple uh, or you might recall that the earthly temple the, the veil was rent upon the death of Jesus. In verse 21, <clears throat> and having a high priest, and I might just add, you know, when you go back in the Greek, the wording, uh, the Greek word translated here is high, it means great in verses, in chapter four, verse four, 14. But that is, is that of a high priest, and having a high priest over the house of God, I and mean, that's the church. <clears throat> Christ is the high priest of the church. In verse uh, 22, it says, let us draw near, and that's near to God. Let us draw near with a true heart. And a true heart is one that's free from um, all guile, uh, Deceit, hypocrisy, we're free from them, we're free from that. And it's one that trusts in Christ as the way, the truth, the life, the only means to approach the Father, John 14, verse 6. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Uh, that's the confidence in God and his promises. To doubt God is to dis dishonor him. He goes on to say, having our hearts sprinkled by the blood of Christ from an evil conscience, that's the faculty of the mind. Conscience is the faculty of the mind which distinguishes between right and wrong and prompts one to choose the former and reject the latter. Every act that is contrary to the will of God defiles our conscience. So we want to be uh, have a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. And our body is washed with pure water. And that's the washing of regeneration, Titus 3, verse 5, and the water of washing, Ephesians 5, verse 6. And I might add a, a, a comment about this uh, body is washed with pure water. There was a professor, Moses Stewart. He was uh, interesting thing about him. He uh, went to a, some divinity school up east and became a professor of Greek and Hebrew at Harvard University and, and a, a, some a religious uh, academy. Now that's not so unusual, but what was interesting, he didn't know a word of Greek or Hebrew when he accepted the uh, position. He had to learn it. It kind of tells you what the, those guys back in that time, and this was 200 years ago, kind of tells you what they were able to do. But anyway, he had a comment on this. And he said, it seems to me that there is a plain allusion to the use of water in the initiatory rite of Christian baptism. This is altogether consonant with the method of our author who is everywhere comparing Christian institutions with Jewish ones. So in the case before us, he says, the Jews was, were sprinkled with blood in order that they might be purified so as to have access to God. 
And Christians are internally sprinkled, that is, purified by the blood of Christ. The Jews were washed with water in order to be ceremonially, ceremonially purified so as to come before God. Christians have been washed by the purifying water of baptism. So Ananias exhorts Saul to be baptized and wash away his sins, Acts 22 and 16. In this latter case, and in that before us, the phrase is borrowed from the legal right of washing for purification. So without a doubt, uh, you know, this idea that the baptism is not essential to salvation is a false idea. It was for the purpose of cleansing the sinner of his sins. In verse uh, 23, he said, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised us is faithful. So let us hold fast uh, uh, to the faith we have confessed and cling to the to the hope that which that faith provides. No one else but the individual can do it. No one can do it for you. The first clause uh, that is so fast confession of our hope without wavering is dependent upon the second clause for he who promised is faithful. We should hold fast because God is faithful. And the writer is, uh, was encouraging the reader not to give up. Of course, you know, that the whole purpose of the book was to encourage the Hebrew Christians not to go back into the law of Moses because there's no salvation there. <clears throat> he said, uh, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. While doing the former, uh, don't forget to exhort your brethren. Uh, the former is hold fast the confession. Don't forget to exhort your brethren in Christ for the purpose of exciting and encouraging one another's love and good works. This can't be done in the absence of your own love and good works. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. And you might notice that there were three, uh, I don't know if there's proper English or not, but three let us's. There's one in verse 22, 23, and 24. <clears throat> so I just thought that was uh, interesting to note that. <clears throat> He says, let us uh, do these things, not forsaking, in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. And the, there's a, of course, this is a time of persecution. And I guess uh, faithful Christians have always suffered persecution of one sort or another. But it's in this time of persecution, back in the first century, it was important to assemble for public and social worship. Uh, well, one reason was that neglecting to do so violated an ordinance of God and the example and sanctions of the apostles. <laughs> we can look at Acts uh, 2.42 and uh, 20 verse 7 and also 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 and 2. The uh, first day of the week assembly was a design for worship and edification. Delinquent Hebrews, those that didn't do it, they set a bad example. Uh, they demonstrated by that that it was okay to for forsake the assembly when it became inconvenient. Well, that, that was wrong. It was wrong to do that. Now, the, it says, uh, as you, the more as you see the day approaching, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about what day it was. 
Well, it could be the second coming of Christ, not at this point in time anyway, because no one knew that day. You look at Matthew 13, 32, and Matthew 24 and 26, no one knew what that day was when he would come back. But they would, in those same verses, they would see the abomination of desolation. And they were to flee Judea when they saw it coming. Of course, that was the coming of the destruction of uh, Jerusalem. And it's said by, I think maybe it was Josephus, that the, uh, there were no Jew, no, no Christians killed in the uh, destruction of Jerusalem. I assume that to be true, but the uh, Christians, knowing that you know, this abomination of desolation was coming, knew to flee because they were told to flee when they saw it coming. And uh, you can read the entire 24th chapter of Matthew if you want to get a good uh, idea of what that was all about. In verses 26 to 31, the author gives a solemn warning against the dangers of apostasy and the, the, the fearful consequences of apostasy. In verse 26, he says, for if we sin willfully, and, and I'll go into that, what that uh, means just by looking at the Greek, if we sin willfully after we have seen the uh, knowledge of the truth, and that, that's gained by the active application of our minds to the study of the truth. You don't get it without studying. It is those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become protectors of the uh, Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. That's the ones he's talking about. That, that comes from Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verses four and five. So after we have received the knowledge of the truth, that's gospel truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. For it is, it is impossible if they fall away to renew them to repentance. And that's in that uh, uh, Hebrews, the sixth, uh, chapter six, verses four through six, previously cited. If that happens, even this sacrifice is no longer available to them. <clears throat> now, the Greek word for willfully, <clears throat> as used here, is only used one other time in the New Testament. And that is in uh, 1 Peter 5th chapter, verse 2, where it instructs elders to take the oversight of the flock not by constraint, but willfully. <clears throat> so to sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, that is, obeyed the truth, is to apostatize from Christ. The phrase sin willfully is not a sin of uh, momentary uh, lapse of, of uh, obedience, but it's, it's a sin. Uh, well, the first is of choice and then it becomes a habit. This uh, person will not choose his ways and repent. Just, just not going to happen. But there is a certain fearful expectation of looking forward to looking as King James Version says. There's a fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation that is consuming fire that's mentioned in Hebrews 12, 29, a flaming fire mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 8, which will devour the adversaries. Now, the adversaries are the enemies of God. Now, this is the fearful condition that, that uh, the author is warning against, and it's it's a fearful condition of every apostate from Christ. There's no hope of being saved. In verse 28, it says, anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy from the testimony of two or three witnesses. And if you look at uh, Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter, verses two through seven, 
there was no forgiveness of, for an apostate under the old covenant. The apostate under the superior new covenant would, with his greater light and privileges, apostasy is tolerated even less. Verse 29 says, of much, uh, how much worse punishment do you suppose? And that's a rhetorical question. And the answer to that rhetorical question is much worse. How much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy? Uh, and there's a threefold specification of guilt, which I'll get into just, uh, just a moment. Uh, who has one trampled the Son of God on the foot? Two, he's counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing. And three, insulted the spirit of grace. Where much is given, much is required in, in Luke 12, chapter verses 47 through 48. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself to do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with you. For everyone to whom much is given from him much will, will be required and to whom much has been committed and to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. They get to these threefold uh, specifications. Uh, the first one we said was trample the son of God on foot. Jesus, who being in the form of God and taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So when you apostatize, you trample on the foot of that person who did that. And the second uh, specification, he, uh, you count the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing. The blood of Christ is what cleansed him from his sins. The apostate treats his, this blood by which he was sanctified as unholy and impure. Uh, you know, when he sanctified, he was once a faithful in, in uh, Christ, once a faithful Christian, but he apostatized. And the third specification, he insulted the spirit of grace. God imparts all grace, comfort, and salvation through the spirit. To insult the spirit is the height of wickedness and impiety. Jesus said, as recorded in Matthew 12, chapter verse 32, that there is no forgiveness for those who speak, speak against the spirit. Let's see, I'm not going to finish the 10th chapter, so I think I'll stop here with verse 30 and we'll pick that up uh, next week.